the African Court has um, been set up by a protocol adopted in 1998 by the then OAU. It is now 10 years since the court has in fact been established, since the first election of judges. So it's 10 years of the operation and functional existence of, of the court. So today marks our modest uh, moment of celebration. There are many others and there will be many other moments of celebration and remembrance or uh, rather uh, reflection on the term of the court. So that in the first place is what brought us here. So we, we, we also um, welcome you in that spirit. Um, it is a moment of, of great challenge, I think, and tension. You may know that, and I'm sure some of the panelists will refer to this again, but um, one can approach the court in two ways directly. If a state has accepted the, the jurisdiction of the court to entertain direct uh, complaints, and a number of states have done so, in fact eight, but one of those states, Rwanda, had recently withdrawn its declaration to accept direct access to the court. So there seems to be contestation, there seems to be a challenge to the modest successes that the court has so far accomplished. So it is against that background, the background of uh, improving uh, domains of the, su the successes established by the court, but at the same time, uh, potential erosions of those successes that I think we will share some reflections today. We'll have our panel proper, so to say. Uh, Judge Mwepe will give some reflections about his term and his perception of the uh, role and the challenges and the successes of the court. Thereafter, uh, Professor Dr. Gina Becker will be uh, introducing a specific theme, and that is to link the work of the court more to international human rights law more broadly. And then Professor Vesel Le Roux from the University of the West Cape uh, will speak to the fractious relationship, perhaps sometimes, that the court or South Africa has with the court of interrelations with our domestic system and, and the court itself. When this court started, I was approached, I was the judge president here, I was approached to say that I must avail myself for that court, by the judiciary, by the way, in this country, and in collaboration with the government. The view was that this kind of court should not start without a South African judge being in there for a variety of reasons, but in particular two. One was that, as we are told, or flattered by the world, we had one of the best constitutions in the world. And the idea was that maybe that could cut that kind of culture would flow into this court right at the beginning when foundations were laid. And secondly, as you all know, South Africa is one of the three countries which contributes the most uh, to the African Union in terms of money and budget. So there was a feeling that let us try to, to have a footprint in there. But what happened thereafter was disappointing. How many people in this country, how many lawyers, how many politicians right now even know about the existence of this court? How many of them knew that I served in that court? And how many of them knew that I ended up being the vice president of that court? Even among lawyers, a number of lawyers don't know about that, don't know much about this court. The result is that there has not been the kind of engagement with this court from South African <coughs> lawyers to the extent that one would have thought they would. Um, Therefore, it was disappointing in that regard. I think I forgot the other point that I wanted to make. Now I remember. <laughs> One of the challenges that court had, which must never be underestimated, and we really we're not worried about Europe uh, recognizing our judgments or not. That's the least of our worry. Um, one of the, prop the challenges that we had in setting up that court was because uh, 
50% of the judges came from the civil background, French system. 50% came from the common law or the English system. South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, those were the judges from the English community. To sit together and even draft the rules of court was a major, major problem because some just didn't understand why you would have this kind of rule and while I wouldn't understand why we wouldn't have that kind of rule. In fact, at one time, with regard to a particular case, our French counterparts, people with a French background, were saying, but how can you call somebody who is uh, the complainant in the case, in other words, the plaintiff, how can you call the plaintiff to come and testify in his own case? Because he's biased. He's all obviously going to testify in his own favor. What's the value of that evidence? <laughs> now, it's unthinkable in this country that you can have a case where you can't call the plaintiff. But they, were, they couldn't understand how you could call someone who's obviously biased, who is not going to tell the truth because he has an interest in the case. He can't be a witness. So, but you, we, we needed to engage, and I think that engagement is still going on. And when people talk about how the court has fared and the impact it has made, we must never forget these challenges, colonial packages which we had to carry and, and try to create a court that would cater for all this. So I think sometimes you need to understand that. And you, you will have seen that one of the problems we had rather from the beginning was the fact that many countries had not made the declaration opening themselves up to be brought to the court by individuals or non-governmental organizations. But that remained a problem for us. Um, well, at one time, a brave lawyer from Nigeria was it Mr. Falan, I think, um, decided to take the bull by the horns and he challenged the validity of that provision. And um, as you know, the majority uh, dismissed the, that challenge because his view, and this is interesting from um, an academic point of view, out of which, of course, jurisprudence grows. It grows out of academic debates and circles, and then finds its way, its way into practical interpretation and application by a court of law. And that is why that linkage is and should always be there between academia on the one hand and, and, uh, and the judiciary in any country. But anyway, um, he argued that, and <laughs> uh, these are my own words, I'm trying to simplify. He's, he's arguing that the Charter enjoins every state which has subscribed to it to defend human rights. Now, the protocol, now by, after establishing the court, it then uh, takes away the court's jurisdiction unless some countries have, uh, unless a country has made the declaration. And this argument was therefore that the protocol cannot go against the Charter because, as I say, I'm using my own words, the protocol is the child of, of the Charter and therefore the protocol cannot overrule the Charter or undermine the Charter. To the extent that the protocol uh, denies people access to the court to, to assert and protect their rights enshrined in the Charter, then that protocol was not an offensive against the Charter and therefore that provision is invalid. Uh, the majority of the of the court well, dismissed that on a number of grounds. Um, the minority, of which I was one, felt that this is a good case and this, this restrictive uh, article in the protocol is indeed offending against the main charter and therefore must be invalid. But I sincerely, sometimes when you write a minority judgment, you know that it's not binding on anybody, but 
you are mindful of the fact that, as they say, a uh, minority judgment is the law of the future. You hope that when we shall have left that court, other people will, 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 will prosecute that minority judgment, which for now is useless. But you hope that it will keep the debate alive. But one of the reasons why we stumbled, stop on this duck to that is because we wanted to keep on pricking the conscience of the states and of the NGOs to say there's something wrong here, there's something wrong here. Well, the court was not able to do anything about it, but there are some voices, although in the minority, which are saying there's something wrong here, there's something wrong here, there's something wrong here. And that voice must go on. Um, you, you have referred to uh, a number of cases which are very important. The, 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 the case, the, there's, there's something that um, I want to talk about with regard to, uh, was it Zongo's case? And perhaps also to some extent Ntikila's case with regard to the limitation of jurisdiction in relation to things which occurred before. Um, even though perhaps a state could have, by the time the, the offending conduct took place, the state had already subscribed to the charter, but not yet uh, to, the, to the protocol. We wrestled with this idea, and remember, our, our approach was that we are a court of human rights and we must do everything possible. We must go for realistic, intellectually honest interpretation of, of the Charter, but in a manner that would serve to promote and protect the culture of human rights. But you obviously can't just say nonsensical things in pursuit of that honorable cause. You, you need to be intellectually sound and based. So, for example, with regard to Zongo's case, um, we, we upheld the state's argument that they cannot pursue uh, the murder per se of Mini Zongo because it occurred too long before this and that and then and there. We, we, our view was that, of course, killing somebody <coughs> is an act which becomes immediately complete at that point. It is, it is extinct and it is accomplished. It has ended. The murder itself, the process of killing somebody is not a continuous exercise. The minute you finish killing him, the process is completed. And therefore, when you try to compute the time, whether the time is reasonable, from the time of the occurrence of the murder up to the time you come to us. We'll have to look from the time when the person was killed. He was killed on the 4th of August 2016 at 12 o'clock. Then that's it. The deed of murder ended at 12 o'clock. And if by that time the state was not uh, part to the protocol, then of course there would be a problem. But we, we did not want to throw our arms in the air and say, well, there's nothing we could do. Uh, we didn't invent this principle, but we adopted it to this situation before us. So to simplify it, we said, well, let's, let's not look at the deceased. He was killed. The, the deed of murder was completed at 12 o'clock on such and such a many years ago. But they are the applicants, the wife, the children, and so forth. And uh, they have continuously been trying to get justice. That denial of justice from the time death occurred was a continuous exercise. And therefore, up to this day, that denial is still there. And therefore, we have jurisdiction because the deprivation of justice and fairness before the court, by refusing to investigate properly, it's a continuous thing. We therefore have jurisdiction. And that's how we, we came to that. Much the same thing with Mtikila's case. 
uh, that the continuous prohibition of bar, as uh, the gentleman put it, was, was continuing. And therefore, we want to, we give ourselves, well, we have jurisdiction to hear the matter. And, and that is the kind of jurisprudence we, we, we try to develop. <coughs> and the, another area perhaps worth mentioning would be the requirement of exhausting local remedies. Here again, we borrowed extensively from other institutions. And our view was that um, for, a, for a state to say this person has not exhausted national remedies for coming here, the state must show that those remedies that you are talking about must be effective and must be real. They must not be imaginary or they must not exist only in theory. Now, coming to Mutigila's case, applying this to Mutigila's case, um, the highest court in that country said that this is a political issue. It has been referred to, it's referred to Parliament for resolution. And Parliament appointed a commission of some kind um, to look into resolving this matter, which commission would have reported back to Parliament, which was dominated by the majority of a particular party, which in the first place had perpetrated the, the deed complaint about. And uh, our view was that, firstly, you need, when we speak of remedy, must be of a judicial nature and not of a political nature because the mechanism that they proposed, which they say, as they said, the applicant had to wait for the outcome of that process. We said, but this is a political process. It can be withdrawn by the majority party in parliament. And, and that can be a real remedy. And, and uh, we believe that we, we are not barred from here in this case because you say these people have not waited for the outcome of this process. And incidentally, uh, the person who chaired that commission and uh, now is now the, and uh, he was the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice of Tanzania, now he's the President of the court. But anyway, we said, no, we cannot wait for that because this is a political process, as you say, uh, is in the hands and control of a majority party and can be terminated this way or another. But we then felt that that was not uh, uh, the kind of remedy that we could say the person should have exhausted before coming to us. Much the same way with the Zongo's case, the difficulty which the with Burkina Faso had with Zongo's case was that the cessation court, as they call it, well, it existed, it could function, but there was evidence that sometimes in the simplest of cases, it gives judgment after five years. And, and we felt that um, given the facts of this particular case, um, it would not constitute a viable remedy as opposed to, to the court. Um, the one aspect I should mention about Konate's case um, was the issue of criminal defamation. Looking at the majority judgment, it's a complex judgment like all others. If you look at it, they, were, they would have been happy. Uh, they would have been happy if he, were, he was convicted of criminal defamation, but not sentenced to prison, and uh, not a heavy fine, and not closing down his newspaper. Um, but the, the, the view of the minority of which I was one was that no, that's good enough. That's not good enough. It's not good enough to say or to <coughs> support the view that, well, if, if he had not been sentenced to prison, that would, that would have been fine and, and fine. Our view was that 
we must go further than that. We must take the bull by the horns and say, do away with criminal defamation altogether. We don't care whether you 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 would have sentenced him to one day imprisonment or whether you would have sentenced him, given him the fine of one dollar. We just have a problem with the whole concept, notion of um, criminalizing defamation. And uh, if a person goes too far, um, that person would, could be charged in terms of other laws, which are there, uh, such as sabotage or sedition or incitement and so forth. But don't don't bring or sustain the crime of, um, well, criminal defamation. And that was the difficulty with the minority head. And I was happy to, I was disappointed by some kind of a judgment in this country. And, uh, but the trend that was pursued and argued later in this country seemed to go the direction that the minority uh, opinion uh, said in the, in the Zongos case. But uh, if the court has contributed towards um, generating a debate about the desirability of criminal defamation, and if the minority judgment has in fact contributed towards that, I think that would be a good uh, uh, exercise. There are a number of other issues that I could leave out, but let me tell you about the reasoning in, um, in Zongo's case. Um, no, uh, no, 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 not Zongo's case. No, yes. Um, the rights of the um, journalists. I think some of us felt that um, by not diligently investigating the case against the, the murderers of Zongo, the, the state was in fact, in a sense, um, undermining the right of, of freedom of expression and so forth the public to know from journalists and journalists to express themselves because that failure, the effect of that failure was um, constituted a chilling effect against invest investigative journalism. Because at the back of your mind, you might say, well, if I discover horrible things, I might die, be killed, and nobody will be arrested. And that would deter journalists in the exercise of their duties. And that was the the view of some of some of some of the judges, and uh, and I think it's the majority. You know, some some people expressed their minor. There was a minority view, which said that there was no evidence. I was not in that one. I would have been against that one, because it rejected the argument of the chilling effect on the journalists' activities. Because that minority judgment was saying there is no evidence that after Zongo was killed, journalists in Burkina Faso were, were deterred from doing their duties and that sort of thing. I, I didn't think we had to wait until we got that evidence. Uh, I think there are many other things we can do, but I think I should leave time for my colleagues. I think it's worth noting um, that from its inception, the African Charter, um, and subsequently also its supervisory mechanisms, including the African Court, um, have been described in relatively disparaging terms. Um, and so whilst the language used to describe the African system um, in international human rights law and key human rights texts has softened over time, um, we still find a sort of value-laden approach and an overall marginalization of the African um, system. And so we see that substantially less space is given in key human rights texts to the African system. Um, and the African court in particular often 
um, occupies no more than footnote status. Um, in some instances, the, the contribution or the potential contribution which the African system has in relation to international human rights law um, is completely ignored. And we see this not only in academic texts, but we also see this in relation to um, judgments, decisions by the European Court, by the Inter-American Commission and um, Inter-American uh, Court. And whilst we only have a handful of judgments um, in, in relation to the African court, and that offers perhaps a partial explanation for this particular state of affairs, I think it's also likely that there's this misguided belief that there's <coughs> nothing particularly useful to be gained from looking to the African system in relation to human rights um, protection. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that <coughs> perhaps isn't the case in this room, but beyond um, this room, that certainly does seem to be the case. I think it's useful, um, before we actually look at the potential contribution of the court, to briefly sketch the context within which the court um, has come into being, um, because I think that allows us to, to understand the context within which the court has operated, some of the constraints um, which the, within which the court has operated, and, and to perhaps also then fairly assess how far the court has come. Um, so the first proposal um, to introduce an African court to uh, oversee human rights protection on the African continent was made way back in 1961. Um, in general, the debate as to whether or not to make provision for a commission and a court um, was relatively short-lived. Um, and the reasons why ultimately a decision was made to provide for only um, supervision initially by um, a commission are manifold. Um, the, the arguments that are most often preferred in this regard are that um, a commission with sort of conciliatory functions was more in keeping with the sort of dispute resolution mechanisms that you find on the African continent. You'll also see that you know, people were arguing that this is somehow staking out a different path from the European and the inter-American systems, that Africans were essentially asserting their African identity. Um, but a closer scrutiny um, reveals a possibility of other factors playing a decisive role. Um, Self-interest, uh, the preservation of the status quo, and key, um, the preservation of state sovereignty. Um, ultimately leading to a decision to create um, certainly what on paper, um, in practice, however, the Commission um, has gone beyond what perhaps the drafters had initially envisaged, um, but created an essentially weak mechanism, the African Commission. Um, and we see that even prior to the Commission coming into operation and subsequent to it, uh, various actors, uh, academic commentators, um, calling for the need for a court. Um, because they saw the Commission as being largely ineffective and unable to deal with uh, human rights violations, particularly in relation to the issue of remedies and the issuing of binding uh, judgments. And so whilst the calls initially came from academics and came from outside of the continent, very soon after they were picked up by actors um, on the continent. So we have African NGOs advocating for the creation um, of a court. Um, the OAU comes to the game somewhat late um, and is really only spurred into action um, once um, the events in relation to Rwanda um, come to the fore. Um, and it's really, and, and it hinges again on the issue of state sovereignty, and I'll, I'll return to this theme of state sovereignty repeatedly over the course of my very brief talk, um, that um, African states could see the sort of double standards which applied um, in relation to exceptions to the principle of sovereignty. So Western states were willing to intervene in relation to Yugoslavia, but not willing to do anything in relation to uh, Rwanda. Um, and this, I suppose, to some extent, um, caused soul searching from on the part of African states um, to re-examine um, their long-held views in relation to uh, state sovereignty. Um, and so we see in June 1994, um, the resolution calling um, for um, a meeting to convene to discuss the creation of the court. Several drafts later, um, and uh, I should perhaps add at this point that um, my PhD was on the topic of the court. Uh, I started my PhD in 2001, so before the court was actually um, operational. Um, meant, uh, just a note to those of you who are perhaps considering a PhD, don't do a PhD on, a, on an institution which exists on paper only. Um, <laughs> 
for what that's <laughs> worth. Um, but the, the protocol establishing the court is adopted in 1998, and many people see this as um, a means of addressing uh, the normative as well as institutional weaknesses that have plagued um, the uh, commission and the work of the commission. And um, I'd argued somewhat cynically um, in my PhD that uh, the African court should not be seen as a panacea for human rights protection. Um, that the court was constrained by the lack of universal ratification of the protocol. There were provisions in its foundational instrument in the protocol um, which could potentially be given a state-centric interpretation, um, as well as the sort of overall prevailing climate, political climate, in which states um, were more adept to talking human rights than doing anything meaningful about it. Um, but I nonetheless raised the question um, in my concluding chapter as to whether or not um, the court had the potential to positively impact on the human rights situation on the African continent, uh, and whether it could make... Um, a contribution to international um, human rights law. For Femi Falana case, they weren't willing to go as far as declaring um, Article 34, 6, null and void. They did do so in the subsequent um, case. And I think it is a distinct failure on the part of the majority of the court to, to actually engage with the access to justice arguments. And I think that this is, this is a missed opportunity, um, not only for access to justice in Africa, but has broader, um, potentially broader, could have had broader um, implications for international uh, human rights law. Um, the extent to which advisory opinions might be used as a means to circumvent the lack of individual access, I think, remains uncertain. The court has yet to express itself definitively on Article um, 4. I think it's disappointing that uh, it rejected an application by a coalition of NGOs seeking clarification on which obligations enjoy precedence, uh, treaty obligations under the Rome Statute, or AU resolutions um, relating to uh, the ICC, um, and, and did so without considering, um, as once again one of the dissenters, uh, Justice Oguruguz, noted um, whether or not the Rome Statute um, was in fact a human rights treaty. I think that's, that's another missed opportunity. Um, there are also a number of pending advisory opinions which have the potential to make a significant impact on uh, international human rights law. Uh, these include the relisted CERAC case, um, which I think has the potential to break new ground in relation to Article 2, the non-discrimination provision, and more generally the sort of nexus between uh, poverty and uh, human rights. Um, The advisory opinion uh, requested by four African NGOs, including the Centre, um, in which they seek an interpretation of Article 6D of the Maputo <coughs> Protocol, um, is another instance um, in which um, I think there is, is, is significant room for development and might well open up again that, that chasm that we saw in relation to the Femi Falana case between the sort of textualists and, and the contextualists, the, 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 the judges that um, favour a more purpose of approach uh, to interpretation. Um, if we look at the types of contentious cases that have been brought, they focus primarily on civil and political rights, have focused actually exclusively almost on, on civil and political rights. Um, I think the advisory opinions that I've pointed to um, open up the door to um, the possibility of, of other types of cases being heard. Um, the African Commission um, against Kenya um, also uh, presents the opportunity uh, to change um, the landscape in this regard, uh, with the court being asked, well, ultimately being asked, to express itself on the, the eviction of the Ogiek, uh, people of the Mao Forest and the Rift Valley. Um, and it's with regards to these types of cases, I think, that the court has the potential to develop a truly African uh, jurisprudence, and one which has a valuable contribution to make not only to human rights law in Africa, but to international human rights law more broadly. Um, and I think, and I want to return to the issue of the need for dialogue with national institutions. And I think one way in which this can occur um, is for the African court to reference um, national decisions from across the continent. Um, and in this way, potentially engendering at least some degree of buy-in on the part of um, arguably one of the most important actors in relation to human rights compliance on the continent. I'd spoken at the outset um, of the marginalization of the African system, um, and I think that the court and the African system as a whole bears some responsibility for the state of affairs. Um, the court can 
make a significant contribution to international human rights law, but it has to rise to the challenge. Uh, in particular, it has to forge a jurisprudence that speaks to Africa, simultaneously and delicately balancing the demands of state sovereignty on the one hand uh, with the imperative of human rights on the other. Part. The first part, I uh, wanted to say something about uh, South Africa's uh, relationship. The second part about the court's response, not directly to South Africa, but to the issues um, that South Africa plays on the table. And then the third part, I wanted to allude to one of those responses and comment a little bit further about that. Um, I want to say thank you to France. Um, for inviting me. It's really nice to be back here. It's nice to, to see old faces. This is where I studied, and that's where I want to start, because in 1986, I was a law student at the University of Pretoria, and two things happened that year, as you know. We're celebrating the one. The charter um, uh, came into operation. And the second one, grant apartheid ended, constitutionally speaking. Um, influx control was abolished, Citizenship was restored to all black South Africans, the denationalization ended. And so, in 86, basically, a new constitutional model had to be developed for South Africa. And those two things, the post-apartheid constitutional model, model of democracy and the charter rights, the interaction between those two uh, has been a constant theme over the past 30 years. And it's in that, bringing those two things together, that I wanted to make the core theme of my paper. It seems, it seems to me that there can only be a successful post-apartheid democracy if that democracy is not a national or nationalist one, but a transnational democracy. Um, and so the question is whether um, and how the court and human rights courts generally can contribute to this transnational democracy um, uh, that 86, I think, placed on the table. South Africa, of course, was a latecomer to this whole thing. We joined in 96. There was promise. That was in the time when we drafted the constitution we have now. And in that time, the charter was ratified. The constitution included all these wonderful provisions, section 391. Um, some people spoke about a cosmopolitan democracy, that cosmopol cosmopolitanism became, was recognized as one of the founding values of the post apartheid constitution. Um, of course, um, with the uh, assistance of the Centre year and one of our students at the University of Western Cape, South Africans soon explored this con con uh, um, cosmopolitan dimension that Africa opened up in the Prince case, where the matter was taken from the Constitutional Court to the Commission and further on. But by and large, South Africans haven't really engaged with this um, African system. Um, that promise seems to have stalled. Move on 10 years and we in uh, 2006, when the court came into operation. Uh, South Africa ratified, but didn't make the declaration. It seems that that initial promise um, became stalled. Uh, two cases involving South Africa, two attempts were made to take matters to the court, but both were dismissed because the court said that it lacked jurisdiction to hear disputes between the South African government and individuals. Um, if you move on 10 further years where we are today, it seems that this initial promise did not only stall, but it's now been reversed. More and more, South Africa is taking stance on the international um, um, scene against basic uh, human rights, against the protection of human rights defenders. South Africa has actively contributed in refashioning the Sadiq Tribunal, taking away individual access there. Um, so South Africa has then become one of the respondents before the Commission in Timbani case uh, about the duty on the state to ensure access to transnational courts and institutions as part of its commitment to promote human rights culture. We know that the Commission didn't grant um, I didn't listen favorably to that argument. And the matter is now before the South African courts, as I understand it. The Law Society of South Africa has taken um, matters in front of the um, Victoria High Court. Um, 
to say, well, that's a violation, then if it's not of the Charter, but of the South African Constitution. We'll see where that comes, uh, where that goes. In other words, in short, a promise that was stalled and it's now been reversed, so to speak, uh, in brief. This is not unique. South Africa is not unique. The story is not uh, unique. It's typical of many other African states. My question is how the court responded to uh, this kind of uh, South African position. And I think what stands out uh, is not necessarily the jurisprudence of the court, um, but the non-judicial activities as well. So I wanted to speak about four things. I won't now. I just highlight them briefly. If you look at the court's response to uh, this difficulty, and for me, the 2010 years when the court didn't have any judicial activities like a watershed, it's as if the court then realized we'll have to do something and take a more activist role. So the court has done four things and four initiatives that one should law, uh, congratulate and support. The first one is to start on an active campaign for direct access. So the court has organized and participated in conferences, um, had um, diplomatic meetings with uh, various states, most recently in October last year in South Africa as well, to try and raise consciousness about the issue of direct access. Secondly, the court has finalized its relationship with the Commission and the referral proce uh, procedures so that matters can, um, within the current system, be referred with more predictability and regularity between the court. There are certain uncertainties and questions about that, Let's leave that as it may. The third thing which I don't want to speak about because justice greatly raised it itself are those minority judgments and those creative attempts by him and his fellow judges to push the law and to declare um, the declaration requirement unconstitutional. What I wanted to focus on is the fourth element of this, uh, of this initiative by the court and that is what you find in the activity reports of the court. If you read the activity report, reports, you find a <coughs> tentative suggestion about another reason why direct access is important. And there the court speaks about the African Union architecture. The court speaks about the African Union project. The court speaks about a future constitutionalization <coughs> of international human rights law in Africa. The court speaks about an equal branch of a future African government. Um, in other words, the court very much embraces the Agenda 2063 um, project of the African Union and sees itself as a court that will contribute to African integration. And I wanted to say one or two things about that aspect because I think that extrajudicial source of uh, thinking that you find in those activity reports can be usefully explored by us and, and by academics. So this question of African integration and a future constitution of Africa, this transnational democracy that 86 for me put on the table, is of course controversial. The first idea is where is the people? What are you talking about? African people, African domus, demos, what is holding uh, the people uh, together? And so you find uh, skepticism and criticism against the possibility of any transnational democracy. And if you then have a court that's putting itself out there as an institution that operates in a political vacuum, in a democratic vacuum, um, that becomes even worse. So you have critics that uh, criticize, you know that, uh, criticize the human rights discourse as an example of what they call the humanitarian critique, where human rights is separated from politics and then become overrun by pity of philanthropy, instead of empowering people to become more active participatory citizens, you disempower them to be um, victims or um, subjects that needed to be pitied. Uh, the question is then whether the court can counter this criticism. I think what you find in the activity reports, without developing it in any more detail, is a counter vision. The court aligns itself there with other uh, democratic institutions. In other words, the court in a sense say that this conception of an African people, of an African democracy, can only develop through a respect for human rights. It's because Africans identify themselves with the Charter and as bearers of equal rights under the Charter that a sense of African, a sense of an African people can originate. I find that a very creative and a very challenging concept. It has resonance 
with what in the European context is called constitutional patriotism. So people brought together not by patriotism to any specific leader or to any specific uh, tribe, but to the constitution or to the charter. Is such a thing possible? Can the court play this role? Can this court create this <coughs> charter patriotism that is to inaugurate the constitutional framework for a future African society? That's what the court puts itself <coughs> out there as I read the activity reports and say, if you don't grant direct access, we won't be able to play this role. So why is this so? If charter patriotism needs to be developed, then it points towards three things that I just want to briefly highlight. The first one is, of course, the access. If human rights aren't just going to be humanitarian law, but human rights is there to stimulate debate and a sense of charter patriotism, then a plurality of voices and perspectives need to be heard. Greater access, then. Secondly, the interpretive process or the style of reasoning or the methods of interpretation that the court adopts should also not be textualist and prescriptive or definitional, but you should also embrace this idea that human rights is embedded in a democratic contestation, a political process, in a certain sense. And that brings me back to perhaps uh, what I regard as the high point of the court's work thus far, the minority judgments that Justice Mwepe authored and alluded to, and out of respect and honor, um, the place of minority judgments should be in, 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 in enhanced. Um, some courts do not have the right to write minority judgments. Some courts do not like doing so. Some courts like to speak in the voice of the court only. Right from the start, and from those first judgments, the legitimacy of minority judgments and the importance of minority judgments uh, have been placed on the table. It's through minority judgments, this idea of rights as part of a broader debate, as part of a process, as part of a sense of political contestation, and therefore as a sense of something that can create this democratic sense of constitutional patriotism and becomes possible. So, to summarize then, go back to 86, if we say we're looking for a post-apartheid in the South African context, political model or constitutional model, it will have to be a transnational uh, model. The charter that came to operation in 86 and now the work of the court can actively contribute to uh, that vision for the benefit of not only South Africa, but the whole of the continent. I hope I, you didn't miss me between the lines. I tried to <coughs> briefly summarize what I wanted to say. Thanks. Maybe we can discuss it in a bit more.